You didn't think you were going to join us. Sure. Okay. So the agenda today is very, very simple. Uh, we just want to quickly go through the slides of learning unit eight, our final learning unit. And then from there, we are going to then We're then going to just do two exercises and then we call it a day. Okay. Um, shouldn't take us too long to get through to get through this. Okay. This is not working. It's fine. We'll just do it the manual way then. Oh, there we go. Right, so learning unit is division performance evaluation, all right? And it is exactly that, okay? So here our focus is we want to evaluate the performance of our respective divisions, okay? Um, and here they say responsibility accounting is a method of preparing financial information used in evaluating the efficiency and effectiveness of management over the financial performance within their control. Okay. Large diversified organizations are different, sorry, difficult to manage as a single operation. Okay. So they need to decentralize, to be decentralized into manageable parts. Okay. Uh, called responsibility centers or divisions. Okay. Right. So that's the whole reason why we want to do performance evaluation, because we are splitting basically the company into different responsibility centers. And then we obviously need to then check, are our resources being used as effectively as they should be? If not, why? OK, that's why we need to do the evaluation so we can answer those questions. So here it says, responsibility centers include revenue centers, cost centers, profit centers, investment centers okay so yeah all of these are different aspects that are being checked and also um being evaluated in comparison with each other and we'll speak more to that just now okay but here they're saying each responsibility center is assigned a manager who is responsible for aspects of performance um and then also evaluating to see, did what we say from a budget perspective, is that what we managed to achieve? Is that what we managed to achieve? We all looked at uh, variance and actual. I can't remember what learning unit that was. I don't even know if it's, it should maybe not even be in this module, but finance 2A, where we looked at variance. Comparing your actual with your budgeted. Yes, that was 2A, not 2B. Actually. Then planning and controlling of resources with the with their responsibility centers. Okay, right. Then here, potential problems with interdivisional performance measurement. Okay, so here they're basically saying the problem with comparing different divisions. Okay is that not all divisions are the same size. So obviously, if you guys are running a bigger division than mine, your performance is going to look better than mine because your profit is going to be bigger because you guys have bigger revenue than my small little division. Does that make sense? Okay. Then um, different interest rates. I might have been able to go and negotiate a better interest rate than you guys because I have relationships with important people. I'm an important person 
Max that. Okay? Yes. All right. Then the assets being compared have different financial financing methods. Okay? We can't compare apples with oranges. We have to compare apples with apples. So that be becomes problematic. The extent of head office involvement uh, differs. Okay? So obviously, head office might be more involved in supporting certain initiatives uh, than they are with other initiatives for various reasons, um, justifiable, justifiably so in, in some aspects as well. Then, one division is labor intensive and the other is capital intensive for it. Um, again, we're speaking to basically apples and oranges. One division owns production facilities and the other rents. Okay. Uh, products are sold in different markets and have different pricing strategies and face different competitive pressures. Okay. Different asset valuation methods are used. Okay. We spoke about this in accounting where we say if we have different valuation methods, it obviously can give different impressions on the value of the assets that we have, if we're, especially if we're trying to compare uh with different enterprises and so on um, and then finally it says head office allocations should be excluded from divisional performance evaluation okay because we want to see the performance of that division we don't want to see the performance of that division with some outside assistance does that make sense so you will see actually in the exercise that we do where we will actually remove some of the allocation or involvement of head office. Then organizational structures. This is stuff you guys know, so I won't waste too much time on it. But your organizational structure is the manner in which an organization determines how roles, power, and responsibilities are delegated, controlled, and coordinated, and how information flows between management levels. Okay, we'll speak a little more to that when speaking about decentralization, okay? Then functional organizational structure describes a typical hierarchical organizational structure, which em em uh, employees, sorry, employees are managed through clear lines of authority. Okay, so here we're saying who is head of what and who reports to those individuals okay that's what we're speaking to when we talk about uh the functional organizational structure activities of a similar type are placed under the control of an appropriate department head okay so that's functional organizational structure okay then you've got the uh, decentralized organizational structure and i'm sure you guys have gone over this in management but the whole point is that we allow people within their respective spaces or divisions to obviously make decisions, all right? Not everything has to go through certain key personnel, okay? Control is decentralized, okay? There's delegation that takes place, okay? And then here, many organizations uh, choose to decentralize, okay? Why? These are the advantages it presents. Okay, can focus on the organizational strategy. That's top management can focus now on strategy. Um, it empowers and motivates uh, lower level management. Okay, because you now have more ownership over your job, more control. You obviously want to perform better, or you 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 kind of are motivated to give it your best. Because at the end of the day, if you perform poorly, for the most part, that's on you, right? Because you made the decision to go left or right. Whereas if I have no say so, if things fall apart, it's like I told you guys we should have gone left, but you want to go right, right? Um, and then very important, oftentimes the guys who are more involved with the activities in terms of the services, the products, the lower level um, people within the organization, they have more information on what is actually happening within the operating environment. 
as such, when they say, okay, we want to increase sales, for example, let's say we're doing an insurance business, just for argument's sake. Top management will say, you guys need to see more clients on a daily basis. You guys need to uh, do more advertising and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it all makes sense from a distance. But seeing that we are the ones who go and see the clients, we're the ones engaging with these individuals who need insurance, we begin to realize, no, it's not an issue of doing more advertising. It's not an issue of adding more meetings in our calendar. No, it's actually we need to change a particular clause in the product, or we need to do something that speaks more to these type of clients, right? Um, they, because we're involved with the client more closely, we understand what more, uh, what type of value we need to bring in order to increase it, for argument's sake. Okay. And hear what they're saying. If if we then just say, look, we need you guys to do more sales, we pass on that instruction or that goal. Your lower level management will then be able to quickly say, based on the feedback, based, based on the knowledge that we're receiving from our clients and information, this is where we need to go, or this is what we need to do in order to increase it. And they don't need to waste time now sending that information to top management to make a decision or to approve a certain direction. They can just make judgment and execute that. Okay, so that saves time, makes you more efficient. And then four performance uh, divisions are identified. Okay, and then we can obviously ask that manager, hey sir, what are you doing? about this, that, and the third, why are things not coming together in this regard? What was your reasoning behind making certain decisions? That is one key thing uh, that they will always ask you. And uh, considering this outcome, or considering one, two, three things, did you not think it would have been better to go right, as opposed to left, okay? Were you not aware of one, two, three things, all right? So yeah, that also allows us to evaluate poor or identify poor divisions. Then disadvantages of decentralization, competition. We start competing in and amongst ourselves because it's a thing of when it's year end and we have our year end get together, they start giving awards and obviously I want my name to be there as much as you want your name to be there. So we start uh, working in a collaborative manner whilst uh, we are of the same organization. Then there's dilution, oh sorry, duplication, duplication. What we mean by that is in certain regards, you will have your own marketing, I will have my own marketing, I'll have my own purchasing and supply, you will have your own purchasing and supply, which can become very different, right? So, that's one of the massive disadvantages of decentralization. Okay, the advantage of that obviously is we can move at our own pace. You can move at your own pace, right? Um, but it comes with cost if there is duplication. Then lack of control. Top management may feel like they are losing control, and this is why you guys will learn about all these fancy concepts in you know we're spoken speaking about the working world before we started our lecture. You will learn about all these fancy concepts. When you get to industry, you start to see, these guys are not applying these things. And it almost feels obvious that this would be very advantageous for the business, but they're not applying those things. Um, and it's just uh, people and their egos. And it's just about control. And it's just about, this is how we've been doing it for the last seven, eight years. We don't want to change, even though we know it will be in the betterment of the business. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I won't ruin it for you guys. I'm just gonna create sites. Okay. okay. All right. So performance uh, measurement uh, indicators for divisions, and we all everything we shared was to get to this point. Okay. This is how, in a finance world, we evaluate. We look at return on capital employed. That's just one. So we're looking basically at profitability measures. Okay, this is just one of many measures. 
In fact, I don't think we will even exhaust them within this learning unit. Okay, so you'll see more of these as you go along in your finance journey. Earnings before interest and tax divided by the capital employed. Okay, which is your total assets minus your current liability, which can also be viewed as basically your total equity plus your non-current liabilities. Because remember, we will, we will take on non-current liabilities in order to fund assets, machinery, uh, factories, and so on and so forth. Okay. So we want all of that capital that's been employed in those things uh, uh, as our denominator, as our denominator. Then the second one that you get is your return on investment, okay? Is a profitability measure that evaluates the performance of the business. It is the percentage return made over a specified period as a result of making an investment. NB. Invested capital represents the divisional assets that are controllable by the divisional manager or capital employed. Okay. Invested capital. Okay. You'll see that there's a quite a bit of crossover. Okay. Now here's the disadvantage. The disadvantage of return on investment and your return on capital employed is that they include depreciation. Now, as we know, depreciation is not a real cost. Okay? So what they then do, remember we said these things are divided by your capital employed or your capital invested. Okay? And what that then means is as we have depreciation, our assets are decreasing. And because the assets are decreasing, that means the denominator is decreasing. So you guys know from just looking at ratios, if we say five divided by 10, so let's just say five is our profit, divided by 10, our total asset. Okay. Keeping it simple so you get the point. But then we know in, at the end of year one, there's gonna be depreciation on our assets. So that means that 10 is going to turn into a nine. So let's just say our profits remain constant. So five divided by nine, can you see it now looks like we are having a higher return on investment or a higher return on capital employed. But that's not the case. It's just that we are accounting for depreciation, which is not a real cost. Make sense? Okay. But yeah, it does, From, from a tax perspective, because we can, it can reduce our taxes. It does have its financial implications. But yeah, that's, that's the, the key thing that they are highlighting there. Uh, when they say the, the element of depreciation distorts our return on investment. Then profits are affected by accounting principles, which may be outside the control of the divisional land. So basically, how our profits look or are might be dis, uh, might be distorted or might not be a hundred percent good reflection because of the accounting principles. All right, that's what they're basically speaking to there. Thirdly, ratios might not be comparable across two or more divisions, okay? This is because we have uh, different assets within the different divisions and their useful life are different, okay? So when you're now comparing, it's gonna be problematic. Time, timing of investments in assets is different, okay? Um, and then obviously the allocations of head office cost to divisions, if it's not the same, and no divisional manager has full control of how much head office contributes to your respective division. And then we have different definitions of net income and capital employed, all right? You'll see this even in textbooks. Some of them, the formulas for capital employed is slightly different. Um, even for certain ratios, you might find that slightly different. 
Um, but yeah, so that begins to be problematic because it's like, whoa, um, we want to compare apples with apples. Okay, then maximizing return on investment. Okay, this is a big problem. The objective of, re uh, of maximizing return on investment may motivate some divisional managers to select projects that maximize divisional return on investment only, okay? And not that of the organization as a whole. So here we're basically saying, it speaks quite a lot to the competition side of things as well, where it's like, you know what? We are going to make sure that we're doing well, even if it's at the expense of the organization as a whole. I think a lot of managers don't intentionally do that, but it's almost, you could say, it's a survival instinct where it's like, we obviously are going to make sure that we're performing and they don't pay too much mind to at what cost. Okay. Right. And I think, oh, I like That's not the end of it. So to overcome those shortcomings of your return on investment and your return on capital employee, we then have your residual income approach. All right. And this approach is more flexible as uh, more flexible as different cost of capital rate can be applied to investments that have different levels of risk. Okay, so it accommodates the different interest rates. Then typically a project will be accepted if the residual income value is positive. So residual income value is basically we're looking at your a rand amount. Okay, we're looking at a rand amount. We're not looking at a ratio. But now the disadvantage of this is that it's an absolute value. So if we're dealing with divisions that are of varying sizes, we can't compare the performance across those divisions because it's like, yeah, you're a bigger division, you're going to have bigger costs, you're going to have more revenue. So obviously you should have performed better than another division. Okay. So that's the downside to this. Okay. But yeah, I think that is it. That is the theoretical side. So like I said, in this learning unit, we are literally looking at residual income, we're looking at return on investment, and we're looking at return on capital employed. And you'll see um, return on uh, capital employed and return on investment. Uh, sorry, return on, yeah, return on capital employed and return on investment very close related very closely related so let us do you guys want to take a break quickly okay so let's take a break uh, if we can be back by six past we'll then get into 8.1 after 8.1 we'll do 8.2 and we will call it What's now? Um, the two ratios and like residual income. Just look at it. So they'll probably give you different types of questions mm -hmm. that will make you, for instance, when we have a situation where head office has provided some funding, and then we have a situation where head office has not provided. So just those small little changes to see, do you know what you need to do in those instances? But yeah. I think if you practice all those questions, you'll see the two that we practiced, they cover pretty much everything. But yeah, you just need to go over that. I think there's, then 8.4 is a theoretical question. 8.5, yes, practical question. And then 8.3 is multiple choice. So you could almost say that's also theory, but there are some calculations there. So yeah, that's your learning unit eight. It's actually a nice unit. Okay, but yeah, let's quickly take our break and then we'll get into that.